The next speaker, um, Professor Crystal Anderson, joins us uh, from one of our neighbor institutes, George Mason, um, where she's um, an affiliate um, faculty member in English um, and working within the fields of transnational American studies and global Asia's with a focus on popular culture, visual culture, media studies, literature and audience, and reception studies. Um, she has published um, a number of um, uh, papers on Afro-Asian cultural studies in several journals, including, you know, um, African Amer American Review, um, and also she also has book chapters on masculinity in K-pop and the reception of Hallyu in the United States. She's currently working on um, completing her um, second book, um, Seoul in Seoul, Black American Music and K-pop, uh, which explores the impact of um, African American popular music on Korean K uh, Korean pop, R&B, and hip hop. Um, so let's welcome uh, Professor Anderson. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. I am so excited to be here and just so honored to talk about K-pop at this colloquium. So this project for me is a bridge project from the book, which is in copy editing phase. Um, and um, another project that came up during uh, the time I was writing the book and talking to my undergraduate research assistants who were very much into girl groups and they said, why don't you do anything with girl groups? And I'm like, okay, let's see what's out there. Um, so this is kind of the bridge project between um, those two things. With the continued global spread of K-pop comes increased engagement with non-Korean communities. However, K-pop itself is the product of engagement with non-Korean cultures. While some use cultural appropriation to describe this cultural contact, I argue that popular music studies offers us a lens to let us see how K-pop legitimately participates in existing music traditions. Specifically, I'm gonna use the case of vocal-centric K-pop girl groups to challenge the notion of commodification and cultural appropriation by shedding a light on reverberating or the echoing of the R&B music tradition through the incorporation of gospel-inflected vocals, references to 1990s girl groups, black girl groups, and the relationship between R&B and hip hop for women. Examining these musical echoes foregrounds the relationship of K-pop girl groups with other musical traditions, focusing less on their image and appearance and continuing the much needed work on mapping and making sense of the musical dynamics between K-pop and its influences. Cultural appropriation has been transformed from its original use in academic circles. So James O. Young observes that cultural appropriation could refer to both neutral cultural borrowing, which could be, uh, refers to neutral cultural borrowing and negative representation. However, when people accuse K-pop of cultural appropriation, they most likely mean objectionable class of transactions. Negative appropriation or cultural misappropriation, appropriation in a wholly negative sense. Common examples include instances of blackface, which is a kind of negative racial uh, performance meant to mock or demean that originates all the way back in the 19th century. Many of the instances of cultural appropriation or negative cultural appropriation critics point to include instances where K-pop incorporates aspects of another culture. Even though there's no negative performance, many people think that perpetrators erase the culture from which they appropriate the K-pop artists or they fail to give due credit. This type of cultural appropriation gets conflated with the worst negative performance or misuse of culture. I argue that this widespread use of cu cultural appropriation to describe what happens in K-pop reduces the complexity of the cultures in play and relies on a limited vocabulary to describe a plethora of cultural interactions. In the 2018 article for Nylon called What It's Like to Love K-Pop While Black, Taylor Bryant trots out familiar accusations of problematic behavior that range from incidents of blackface to other inappropriate cultural appropriation by K-pop artists, including wearing cornrows, hairstyle originated by black people and closely associated with black culture. 
However, unlike blackface, cornrows on their own do not imply a negative racial performance. In the same article in the online American fashion magazine, Kayla Justiniani describes appropriation as the dominant mode of cultural interaction in K-pop. Quote, the majority of the music borrows from black culture and a good chunk of it straight up steals from it, end quote. Justiniani describes K-pop's interaction with black music as theft. This is problematic for several reasons, and like Robert, I had to cut a whole lot out of this presentation. <laughs> but the most important one is that K-pop artists do not have the same kind of relationship to black popular music as, say, white Americans of the 1950s who did engage in theft. by failing to credit black producers and artists as they whitewash black music and watered down covers of rhythm and blues songs to gain popularity with and profit from white audiences. Think Pat Boone's cover of Fats Domino's Ain't That a Shame from 1955. K-pop producers have not been involved in such large scale misappropriation or misrepresentation. In fact, K-pop artists frequently work with African-American producers and artists to create the music, and these collaborations are clearly documented in promotional music highlight videos that list song personnel, as well as music producers who help promote their K-pop projects on their social media. So Teddy Riley will tell you, yeah, I'm down with K-pop, I work with EXO, blah, 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 in his bio. Rather than watering down the black music tradition, K-pop artists authentically participate in it in ways that can be heard in the music itself, as well as articulated in interviews and a ridiculous number of behind the scenes clips on YouTube. Sometimes charges of cultural appropriation are about those who make them. If listeners don't know about the musical genealogy of genres of black popular music, or fail to explore who makes the music or who influences K-pop artists, such links may be missed. On the other hand, some establish themselves as authorities policing blackness. Both Brian and Justiniani implicitly established themselves as arbiters solely based on their racial identity. Remember the title of the piece. Rather than articulating their credentials, their background, experience, or the criteria they use for judgment. This may say more about them than it does about K-pop, as the artist Jacob B. Satterwhite observes. Homie Baba also notices an undercurrent of ownership implicit in claims of appropriation. Both Justiniani and Bryant set themselves up as arbiters who own black culture in the sense that they get to determine who interacts with it and under what circumstances. However, this common view of appropriation cannot account for multiple factors involved in cultural, in cultural interaction. So for example, the Korean of the popular website Ask a Korean asserts that Korean hip hop artists cannot negatively appropriate from African American culture in the post, quote, K-pop in the age of cultural appropriation. The Korean places hip hop in a position of privilege because of its origin in American culture, but ignores the marginalized place that hip hop occupies in American culture, as well as its use by other marginalized peoples around the world. African Americans were not involved in the decisions to enact American imperialism in East Asia. African Americans are Americans themselves who have a long history of exclusion from and critique of a larger American culture. It was American imperialism that brought all kinds of negative racial performance to East Asia, including blackface. So African Americans are not colonizers in that sense. However, their interaction with Asian and Asian Americans is informed by their experience in a racially divided society that segregates all of them at one point, a legacy of interracial solidarity with Asians and Asian Americans, as well as instances of interracial conflict. Simply saying that K-pop artists cannot negatively appropriate is just as problematic as saying that all K-pop interaction is negative cultural appropriation. 
One alternative to this is to use cultural appropriation, uh, is one of, alternative to this use of cultural appropriation is to unpack the nature of the relationship between the cultures in each instance. Homi Baba suggests the concept of translation, which is the process of interpretation. Unlike appropriation, which comes off as static and fixed, translation has multiple manifestations. Under these circumstances, translation will be able to recognize both instances of cultural appropriation in the negative sense, as well as permutations of influence, affinity, and transformative work. As a result, we can read the interaction between K-pop artists and black culture as one of translation. This is particularly illuminating for the examination of K-pop girl groups. I know you were wondering when I was getting to it. Because K-pop girl groups represent the epitome of commodification for idols. In an article for The New Yorker, John Seabrook uses the metaphor of factory girls to describe K-pop girl groups at SM Entertainment, founded by Lee Suman, whose strategies resemble, quote, the K-pop idol assembly line. Continuing the quote, his stars would be made, not born, according to a sophisticated system of artistic development that would make the star factory that Barry Gordy created at Motown look like a mom and pop operation, end quote. <laughs> Gu Young Kim picks up on the metaphor in her book, From Factory Girls to K-Pop Idol Girls, sorry, his book, Cultural Politics and Developmentalism, Patriarchy and Neoliberalism in South Korea's Popular Music Industry, which equates the K-pop and manufacturing industries and argues that the K-pop industry creates, quote, highly homogenized, predictable music commodities, female idols, whose only aim is to make viable financial profit, end quote. The factory metaphor makes people into, pro into products. This resonates in particular ways for girl groups when the focus is on their image. Images that are largely made for co the consumption of men, according to Stephen Epstein with James Turnbull, quote, the viewer in such videos, K-pop girl videos, is regularly constructed as male, and the potential assertion of subjectivity is accompanied by a coy passivity that returns initiative to men, end quote. Not only do such perceptions overlook the majority female audience for K-pop girl groups and K-pop groups in general, they emphasize appearance and de-emphasize the music. Susan Douglas points to this tendency in popular music, quote, according to the prevailing cultural history of our times, the impact of the boys was serious, lasting, and authentic. They were thoughtful, dedicated rebels, the counterculture leaders, the ones who made history. The impact of the girls was fleeting, superficial, trivial, end quote. Focusing exclusively on the industrial context of K-pop production reduces these girl groups to mere pawns of neoliberal capitalism. Discourses of commodification also interestingly brings up parallels with non-Korean culture. Kim recognizes parallels between K-pop girl groups and Motown girl groups of the 1960s and places both entirely within a capitalist context. Music production by companies produce a profit. It's a gift. However, this music can and does have creative ramifications. Girl groups are important because of their music. They may not play instruments, but their instrument is their voice. Sean McLeod argues that the Crystals vocals help Phil Spector define a sound. Quote, it was young, black, New York girl group, The Crystals, that gave him the blank canvas on which to develop his production skills, and in doing so, he helped create some of the greatest and most influential songs of both the girl group sound and the pop music genre in general. They created the template for the pop sound of the early 1960s. Music dynamics also get missed when we situate K-pop girl groups solely in the context of girl power. Scholarship on pop girl groups is dominated by the concept of girl power, as noted by uh, Christine Griffin. Girl power is not inclusive of all girls. 
Placing K-pop girl groups within a girl power context obscures their resonance with black girl groups. When we place the Spice Girls as the epitome of girl groups, we forget that TLC, the African American female hip hop R&B trio, was the best selling girl group before their arrival. This means that they were popular not only with black fans, but with international fans as well. In fact, the 1990s produced a plethora of vocal centric black girl groups, including In Vogue, Total, Escape, SWV, Destiny's Child, Brownstone, and a whole bunch of others. Their appeal went beyond black girls, much like their 1960s forebears, as Susan Douglas notes. Black girls signaled that all girls can become what they want to be. They also dis, uh, established a distinct vocal musical legacy. Focusing on their music rather than their image makes it possible for us to see how they translate or reverberate the R&B music tradition if we use a popular music studies lens. If we are guided by Baba's notion of translation, then the music of K-pop girl groups represents the perfect site to explore cultural interaction with non-Korean culture, cultures. The 1990s R&B girl group In Vogue and the K-pop girl group Big Mama used gospel-inflected vocals to produce soulful tracks. on is largely a sultry R&B number that benefits from the slick production values of 1990s R&B. It opens with that extended a cappella sequence featuring the vocals of all the members. They use elements from gospel including call and response, the way that they harmonize, and those vocal runs. True to the nature of the group, the lead changes throughout the exchange and the other vocalists exhibit sophisticated vocal ornamentation. Such interplay between voices comes from gospel-inflected soul music, according to Brian Ward, quote, above all, however, soul borrowed from gospel a breathtakingly expressive freedom for its finest individual and collective vocalists. Richard Rishkar explains that such singing techniques served a didactic purpose, namely, quote, to teach black and non-black audiences how to be expressive in a way that is however slippery to define, presented as African-American, end quote. So Riskar is enacting the kind of translation that Baba offered before, one that's not inherently negative, but one that, that, can, that can capture um, nuances in cultural exchange. The vocal ornamentation we hear in Invoke's Hold On can also be found in the Korean group Big Mama's It's Unique. No. Oh, 
very similar to the kind of construction we heard in the En Vogue song. When the voices come together, they sound more like a choir, and less like a quartet. As Rishkar notes, associating this type of singing with this African-American context is helpful because, quote, it is very important to many people, both black and otherwise, to maintain the term black because it, along with related terms like soulful, continues to evoke a unique expressive power even if the meaning and the value of the term differs from person to person. Consequently, Big Mama draws on the melding of pop sensibilities and gospel vocals, just like in Vogue. It is clear and it is obvious the, the performance is not meant to demean or to mock. In addition to sharing the gospel tradition, K-pop girl groups also draw on 1990s black girl groups who incorporate slick production and R&B vocals associated with the urban genre. And so, there would have been a, a comparison between the vocals of the 1990s black girl group Brownstone and um, the, 19, the 2015 release by Red Velvet, Automatic from their Ice Cream Cake album, both of which make use of that very distinctive 1990s R&B sound. Finally, K-pop girl groups draw on the hip-hop inflected R&B of black girl groups of the 1990s. The 1990s group TLC intervened into a largely male hip hop scene in the 1990s. They follow in the footsteps of female rappers like MC Light, Queen Latifah, and Roxanne Shante. So when you see K pop girl groups have the designated rapper and have that designated piece, that is a direct callback to 1990s girl groups. It happens in TLC's um, 1992 track, What About Your Friends, very upbeat party kind of song. And similarly in Mama Moo's um, Oh Ah Yeah, it's upbeat and it also has what um, Eric R. Weirsing calls sick rapping and a funky beat latent melody. While K-pop is very much influenced by black popular music, this paper shows the particular influence on the music, on the music of K-pop girl groups. By using a popular music studies lens, we are able to see their legitimate participation in an established music tradition that goes beyond the theft often suggested by charges of appropriation. What I find interesting is that the K-pop girl groups draw from a range of vocal-centric 1990s girl groups. If one knows the source material, it's easier to make these kinds of connections because they're kind of obvious. Such comparisons show how influential black, cape, black girl groups can be beyond image or beyond their decade even. When we spend time parsing rather than policing the relationship between K-pop and other musical traditions that inform it, we can clearly see these more important connections. Thank you.